Welcome, everyone. I'm Cynthia Hawkins, the gallery director and curator at the Bertha Letter Gallery at the State University of New York in Geneseo. Uh, this ex virtual exhibition is part of a year-long celebration beginning in September uh, to run the academic year 2021 20, to 20 through 2022. This exhibition will be available uh, online uh, at the college's webpage with a link to our Flickr account, which will um, present 10 works by each of eight artists who um, submitted their work for this juried exhibition. The PowerPoint and the Flickr uh, exhibition will also be posted on YouTube. So today we have here eight of our alumni from, I guess the earliest is uh, 1978, which is Don Ciccioni and more recent uh, artists like Lexi Hanna, 2014. And I have here, I'm proud to say, Emily Gibbons, who worked with me in the gallery when she was still a student. So it's been um, a long time, but everyone is, seems to be doing very well and good work. So I'm going to um, let each artist, uh, beginning with, let's see who's right there, Jennifer Croson, who does some really interesting sort of collage, digital, sewing, found photographs kinds of work. And um, it is also really interesting that she actually became a faculty member at a college uh, in, you know, leading the art department. So that's, you're muted. It's actually a, a private girls school, the Marymount School. So I teach high school. Okay. There is a college, the Marymount yeah. College, but this is a private girls school across from the Metropolitan Museum. Yeah. All right, so let's begin with, uh, Jennifer Croson, and she will, everyone will introduce themselves and tell us what year they graduated and how their studies at uh, the art department at SUNY Geneseo impacted them. All right, Jennifer. Okay, so I graduated in 1979. Um, and I remember studying with uh, Rosemary Terry's, I hope I'm pronouncing that who unfortunately died recently. She was quite wonderful because my understanding of being an artist and an art making before Geneseo was, this, was all tied in with talent. Like you, when you went into the studio, you either, you had it or you didn't. And I felt like those first courses in Geneseo with Rosemary, I started to learn, oh, this is art making. It's a verb, it's an action. It's ongoing a process. So that was, that was very freeing for me. And that was, that was really exciting. So those are my early memories. Huh. Alexis. Hi, so my name's Alexis or Lexi Hanna. Um, I had a really interesting experience because when I started college, cause I graduated in 2014, in 2010 is when they announced they were cutting the art department. And so that was, of course, devastating for everyone. I always planned on just taking art classes. I had a lot of, I changed my major so many times, but um, I always wanted to take classes. Um, but what happened is in 2010, a lot of the people that I intended to major transferred out. So I ended up taking classes all the time with less and less students. And by the end of my time at Geneseo, I was getting like private lessons with Tom McPherson, who was this like amazing master of watercolor. He was so like supportive and kind. And I, um, it wasn't my intention to, you know, pursue it as a profession, but now I'm a professional artist. It's my full-time job. And um, I really feel like that time spent really like cultivating um, my skills with him was like hugely beneficial for that. And um, because there were less 
art students, um, I was like sought out for different projects and they had me do a bunch of murals around like the gym and stuff. So it really helped kickstart my career. So I had a really good experience, but it was sad that they cut it. I wish they, they hadn't because it was a, it was an amazing program. So thank you, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily Gibbons. I graduated in 2008. Um, I did oil concentrated in oil, but now I mainly do watercolor. But um, yeah, I also had Tom McPherson for so many classes <laughs> and he was really amazing. And uh, I'm really grateful for everything he taught me. Um, yeah, and I also worked as um, Cynthia's assistant in the gallery and I worked in all the galleries kind of opening and closing. And, and then I started helping Cynthia install. And I really love that and it helped me um, when I graduated and I worked for, which I still am on the board of the, my local arts council and installing shows and everything for them. So, and then I got really into watercolor. So um, yeah, I, I had a great time at Geneseo and I, I, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Susan Craig. Hi, thank you. I graduated in 2001 from Geneseo. And when I think back to my time there, what stands out most is that I sought out art as a stress relief. It was a really good balance from the studying, the reading, the regular classes I was taking for psychology and science and stats. It was such a good balance for me that I was able to find my flow when I went into the studio to work on jewelry and metals and ceramics. I was drawn towards the really hands-on uh, mediums. And I love the feedback that I got from Patricia Case and Carl Shanahan. They helped me to really see um, that what I was creating was the details, those lines, um, the movement. I just quit, like was um, kind of like doing it like just to get some relief and stress relief and kind of find my creative side. And they really gave me good feedback that showed me what, what I was producing and kind of to uh, connect with it in different ways. So it was awesome. And I'm sad that the art department is, is no longer there. Um, but so now I, I seek out photography as a hobby in my art. And it's also just a really good stress relief to be inspired by nature and flowers and beauty that's all around us every day. Thank you. Yep. And Don. I think you're muted, Don. We can't, we can't hear you. We'll give him a minute and um, I'm going to do what I forgot to do. And that is, uh, let's see where that is. Share my screen. And so this is also a PowerPoint with some of your images. There's like five for each of you. So um, that it actually gets to cycle through at least twice. And um, okay, so. Let's see, did Don figure it out? Ask to unmute. I don't know. All right, well, let me uh, move along and hopefully he can figure that out. Oh, here. Who's that? 
<clears throat> Cynthia, this is, I just uh, I just called in because my audio wasn't working on my uh, computer. Okay, great. I'm glad you yeah. figured that out. So tell yeah. us about your uh, time at Geneseo in the art department. Sure. Um, my name is Andy Smith, graduated in 81. Andy. And uh, similar to Susan, I, I didn't um, major so much in art, but I certainly enjoyed uh, several, several of the courses and that um, they were a nice, uh, a nice release. Um, I took a woodworking class from Paul Hepler. And uh, what was nice about that, uh, several of my uh, cross country teammates and I all took that class and it was just a, it was an evening class and it was just a, a great fun thing. And we all produced some, some nice products. Um, I took some drawing. Uh, the funny thing is my, um, you know, what, what I specialize in, in my, in my free time is my photography. Um, and I just, I never was able to, uh, I never made time to take the photography classes there, but, uh, but I had a great time and it's, it's really a, a pleasure to uh, participate in this event and, uh, and see everybody's work. So thank you. So, um, so after you left, uh, Geneseo. So how, you know, did you have an idea right away that you are going to engage in, uh, in a sort of a full-time way with, with art or is it something you evolved to? Anyone can speak up. Um, should can I say something? Yes. Um, well, so I was doing commissioned work for the college for for the throughout some of my time there because I did design like the president's like the holiday card and I was doing the murals. And so I think, you know, getting your first commissions, it kind of gives you that confidence to continue doing it, you know, and that to say like, oh, I'm a working artist. That's what I do. So I continued. Uh, doing that and then it just be, it just kind of naturally turned into a full-time thing because whenever you do one thing you know with the that's the cool thing about social media it's so easy to get it out there so you just share it and then someone else is like oh I'm interested in that so I ended up doing murals all over and custom commissions and stuff so yeah and I pretty much developed a portfolio just from my time in Geneseo so it really helped for that. That's really amazing to like have that you know sort of like walk evolve into it as a professional immediately like that that's really unusual so i know that emily went to found a position with the was it Cortland? where was that yeah the the um the arts council here in Cortland. yeah yeah and you were teaching there are you, are you still teaching there yes yeah i do workshops um usually kind of around the country and most like a yearly one in Ireland. Um, and yeah, and I, yeah, I moved to Cortland to work at a frame shop and then I got involved in the Arts Council and um, now I'm on the board of the Arts Council because I have a three-year-old, so I stay home with him and um, paint with him. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a good community here and I'm, like to be involved in the arts community. And so, yeah, that's important to me. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so Jennifer Croson, you left Geneseo and immediately went to, um, to graduate school for art or to be an art teacher. I can't hear you. After Geneseo, I went to, I went to New York City. And I did, actually didn't go to graduate school 10 years later. So I just took courses at the, um, the Art Students League. But really, I went to the Metropolitan Museum like a homing pigeon and just sat in front of those works, the Goyas, the Manets, the Rembrandts. And just, I just, uh, they were like friends. 
I just kept going there. And I, I didn't know how, really, honestly, I didn't know how to become an artist. Then I, I went to graduate school, Queens College, and that was a, a wonderful experience for me. So, but my early inspiration, you know, were these great masters. And then, then in, should I continue or that I don't want to keep going? <laughs> well, it's all right. Um... I mean, I also, so let's, um, one, another person who, um, Don, he, uh, I first became aware of him. We did an uh, alumni juried show a couple number of years ago, and he does this handmade paper using handmade paper. And this, some of the pieces he, he sent for this virtual exhibition include like, uh, photographs embedded in them somehow. Do you want to talk about how your work evolved since you, since, um, after you left Geneseo, Don? Don? I guess we can't uh, hear him. So, um, but if you, you'll see in this rolling, um, um, let me see where Don is. So that you can hear, hear some of his work. So, um, yeah, I find it really interesting also this handmade paper that he's been doing. And um, I just find that over years uh, of all the artists I've ever known, I know very few who do do that. So um, I want to thank him for, you know, sending this work because it is different from so many others. And so I know... Um, so how does, I mean, I know some of you have jobs and positions that have, don't have anything to do with art, like, like Andy, and I actually don't know what um, um, Don does for a living offhand, but um, how often do you get to do, to do your artwork? You know, even as teachers, right? Even as professionals, you know, some people you don't actually have, you know, enormous amount of time to do your work. How does that work for you? I, I could jump in on that. This is Andy. Um, I do a lot of, uh, I'm in environmental consulting and I do a lot of field work, um, which takes me around the state and it's, actually a bit of a pleasure to be able to go onto lands that uh, you know are typically not accessible and see sites that that I wouldn't normally see so um, of course I'm working so I don't I don't have time to capture everything the way I'd like to with my camera but um, but it does give me insight into into different areas different places that I'd like to visit when I do have more time and, um, you know, I, a lot of the times weekends or, or, you know, holiday will, will travel just around the state and, and go to places that I've areas that I've seen and, and just take the time that I would like to with my camera and the, the lighting that I'd like to work with. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I especially like working with are shadows and that's, all the more evident early morning and, and early evening. And uh, that, so that's, so even though it's not my mainstay, that's not what I do for a living. It's, it's something that it's always, as I'm traveling around it, it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to see uh, different areas and, and think about what I might, what I might do for a visit. So that's, that's one of the ways that I can kind of combine my day to day with uh you know, with my passion for photography. So Susan, speaking about photography and you thinking of it as 
you know, sort of a hobby, um, how do you make time for it? Similar to Andy too, I try to integrate um, photography into where I'm going. If I'm traveling um, this past year really has provided me more time to slow down and notice things with my camera. Um, I was transitioning between jobs during the pandemic. So I had more time to explore the gardens that I grow. Um, all of my photos here for the slideshow are from my own backyard. So I've, I do um, perennial gardening and vegetable gardening. So I had some time to really get out there and appreciate the hard work I did to you know, plant and prune and weed and grow flowers, vegetables, and just stop and use my camera in those spaces too, to notice those details and colors. So with working too, it's just about carving out that time because for me, it's a, it's a really good uh, release and de-stressor from left brain, right brain type activities. I work in compliance, so it's very you know regimented and um, healthcare compliance and consulting. So photography is like the opposite of, of those skills, I guess. And it's um, when I do make time for it, I, I always realize that it's important for me to just fit that in and it's good for my mental health and just to uh, be creative and experience new things outside with my camera. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, we can't forget, I can't forget about the last year and a half, can we? So, I mean, how did that, you know, working from home impact your, uh, your time to make art? I mean, I know that a lot of people, especially had to like transition like immediately to working from home and that was a big challenge for almost everyone. But some people found that they had, you know, it afforded them more time to think about their, their artwork. Um, was that the case for any of you? Or was it just horrible? <laughs> no, I, I can speak to that. I, um... First of all, I teach and that whole Zoom experience with my students was just fascinating because the prompts I gave them, first of all, and what they came up for improvising was really so brilliant. I just love, you know, taking cereal boxes, opening them up, painting on it. It was kind of really exciting and inspiring. But my studio is in, I'm in Brooklyn, so my studio is downstairs. So. I was there all the time. It was kind of spectacular. Besides, you know, the horrors of the thing, I, I was, I made a lot of work during that time. How about you, <clears throat> uh, uh, Lexi? Um, yeah, I. Well, it's interesting because my commissions, like ordered paintings, I could always do them from home anywhere. So not a lot changed in that regard. I also switched to doing my, I give private lessons and I like mentor artists on their career, but that was easy to transition to online for me. But because we were home so much, I, every time I had like a big commission for like a company, like a bigger thing, I would, it, might, it would just destroy my home, just stuff everywhere. So it actually inspired me to finally get my own private studio where I am right now. So, um, and having a, a workspace here where um, it's dedicated to just doing my artwork, that has helped a lot. So, yeah. Uh, just, just a second. Um, let me see. Somebody merge with audio. I'm afraid to do anything like that. Somebody is uh, having a reverb there. And it must be that they are on a phone and something else at the same time. So I don't know if you, who it is, but uh, see if you can figure that out. So, yeah, so you just got, you got a separate studio from your house, you said? Yeah, it's really cool. It's called Albany Barn and it's a collective of artists. Um, there's like photographers, different types of artists and stuff. So we 
all have like studio spaces in this greater building. We also do plays here, um, all kinds of exhibitions. It's a really cool space. I'm like really happy to be here. So good, good. I know. I'm just moving into a new studio in a couple of weeks. I can't wait. Oh, I'm awesome. <laughs> It's just in you, you know paint, painting the size paintings I like to make in a in a small like bedroom space is just like yeah it makes a big difference to have the space. Oh, yeah. so, so let me ask like who have other artists influenced your work before earlier now who would you say are like say some interesting people that you know, might inspire you or whose work you appreciate. Do you want me to call on you? <laughs> All right, Emily, I see that you're do, you do a lot of watercolor. I mean, are there watercolorists that you really appreciate? I know when I was starting out painting myself, I thought I was gonna be a watercolor painter. And, and I was really into, um, uh, Oh no, I'm gonna forget his name. Um, Birchfield, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, Charles Birchfield, yeah. Ooh, yeah, um, yeah, I did mostly oil in Geneseo and then I, when I got a job in Cortland, the um, artist who owned the frame shop was David Beal and he is a watercolor artist. So I started taking classes from him and got really into it. And um, we teach together our workshops um and so yeah he really inspired me to you know pursue watercolor and kind of figure out how to make cobble together a bunch of things to make a living <laughs> um but yeah i um yeah i'm inspired by him and then yeah art history painters um emily carr um the canadian artist I always really liked her watercolors. Um, Birchfield was really awesome. And now, yeah, I just try to work with a lot of local artists and um, follow a lot of like artist mothers because that was a tough transition for me when they had a kid who didn't sleep. So I <laughs> kind of, you know, got inspiration and support from other artist mothers who kind of figured out how to paint like usually really late at night and um, um, yeah, I'm also have a out of home studio, which has been super helpful because I can paint, leave things out and paint large and um, yeah. And I, I took a summer class when I was at Geneseo with George Dugan um, in Ireland and he was a big inspiration. Um, kind of taught me how to paint plein air outside, which I still use, do all the time. So he was really inspiring to me also. <laughs> so I'm mean, this past year, I mean, we haven't been able to go to museums or galleries or anything. So how do we, you know, how did we get to nourish ourselves as artists during this time? this past year and a half, you know? That's a good question because you need to keep looking at things, you know, work by other people to, um, how do we do that? I actually do so much of my business through Instagram. I get a lot of my clients through there. Um, so I found just the beauty of the internet. I mean, obviously it's not, I wanna be in person looking at these things, but for a while we couldn't. So it was, um, it was pretty cool because I spent a lot of time like finding more and more artists like that way. Um, you know, it's cool. You can find an artist you like and then see who they follow and see who they follow. And now I just have a feed every day of like, so much amazing art from all over the world all the time. So that made it easier for sure. Yeah, I know a lot of artists and some people who are like a bit, you know, a few years older, you know, are just have recently gotten into like Instagram and, you know, in terms of showing the rest of the world what they're doing which was really, you know, 
I mean, it's really a godsend and after what we've been through to maintain and build new relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think, and Lex, Alexis here has done a major, you know, that's a really important aspect of it now. Cause I do recall years ago, galleries used to start asking the artists to do like this PR for themselves. You know what I mean? Telling people uh, how to get, I don't know, buyers into the gallery, but now it's 100%. I mean, you can't even do it without, you have to know that it's just part of it, right? Part of your career, you know. So how, um, so what's, what do you look forward to in the future with your, with your work? More of the same? More, uh, introducing new media into your practice. I think like Jennifer here, Croson has some, you know, for instance, these, let's see if this will do this pause. Um, would you like to explain, uh, tell us about your practice here? Cause it's really, really interesting. And uh, that is- well well, sure. I, I I think, you know, in graduate school, I got really excited about, you know, conceptual artists. I couldn't believe you could make an object from an abstract concept. But then I started reading more and more fiction books, and I was really interested in storytelling. So some of the artists I really love that, you know, told these figurative narratives were like Nicole Eisenman, Dana Schutz. Uh, Najid, uh, Najid Kar, uh, Quinnally Crosby. So I really, I wanted to tell a story. And the other, you know, and the, but I never painting, I was, my background is from sculpture. So there's something about moving objects, constructing that always was an, an important element. So I would actually, I use vernacular photos that I find on eBay, Etsy, I'll, extract them from an old photo. The house was from um, the, uh, from another site, the lions, I found photographs somewhere. And then I actually reconstruct a diorama on my desk. I reconstruct the whole thing, build it. So it's, you know, it's three dimensional. Then I'll photograph it. And then I will, like all those little styrofoam bricks, everything is 3D. And then I'll photograph it and then I'll digitally alter it. Mm -hmm. So I really want to make a real space, a palpable real space. You can feel behind the house to have those narratives unfold. The stories are unfold in like a 3D, an actual 3D space. So well what's neat about what's neat about that shot is it's just so evocative of uh, several things come to mind for me looking at that. It's it's kind of like a a yellow brick road that's that's in bad shape, and then the lions make me think of the New York Public Library, and and just yes, uh, all yes. these these this imagery that just sort of jumps out at you. It's it's, it's a really <laughs> neat really neat work. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I like to yeah. juxtapose weird things, and it's it's yeah. surreal. Mm -hmm. It's strange. But just to bring these, I'm actually inviting all these images and people to come back to life again. I feel like Frankenstein. What, <laughs> I take them from their history, take them from their photos, and I kind of make them perform and collaborate with me. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, great. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, I like those too. They're sort of, and, but you know, this brings up for me uh, like uh, the question of abstraction. You know, like I feel like Emily's watercolors are very abstract. You know, even though they're really based in the landscape. You know, and um, I think you know, it, one has to. Like, I think a redefinition of abstraction is not just, you know, it needs to be more nuanced because even things that are figurative are not identical. They're still an approximation of what you see. So, and, and 
I think we all would all agree that when somebody paints it or photographs it, somehow they become part of it, you know, right? So, I mean, especially when you talk about, let's say portraits and especially say people early in their careers, they seem to always be in the portrait. You know, the portrait of some other person actually looks more like them, which is like strange as, you know, that's, really peculiar, but it's like a really, it happens a lot. So, so then the figurative figuration is not, can't be perceived as literal. So it's some form mm -hmm. of it. Definitely. <laughs> so where, uh, where are we going? You know, where, what's, what's in your future? you know, exhibitions, more commissions, of course. Um, what, what do you think, where, where do you think your work's gonna go next? Um, well, I've been doing a lot of murals for like businesses, homes, churches, stuff, but um, I wanna work like bigger and bigger, like around Albany, there's a lot of like huge, like under these underpasses and stuff. So that's, I hope to work bigger. It's just kind of scary. I don't know if any of you have been on a lift before. It kind of freaks me out, but that's like part of it. So long-term, I think that's something eventually I'll do if I can get over that. Cause for some of my pieces I've had to use, you know, the big machinery and it's a little intimidating, but I think it's fun to aspire to. Oh yeah. We've been to Philadelphia. They have the most extraordinary mural program. Oh, the best, yeah. Uh, it's just amazing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But when you do these murals, you usually have to hire people to work with you, don't you? Are you, you I've, been, I've been working solo for a long time. And I think down the road, that would be, like for those huge, big, big ones, yeah, you have to get a team. A lot of the ones I do, I'm able to navigate myself. Um, sometimes I'll have like, a friend or partner come in to help with like base layers and stuff like I did recently for a big mural I did for a co-op nearby um but yeah someday big team big walls <laughs> well good luck to you I mean I think the mural programs really are uh one way that cities and towns can you know um make themselves more attractive you know buildings that are no longer used become, you know, yeah. force and you use for good, you know? Yeah, and well, and it helps signify too, like what the building is. Like right now I'm working on a big one for our local food pantries. They like overlook 60 food pantries around the capital district. And um, no one knows what the building is. So we're making this big, beautiful, like this is the food pantry side <laughs> so that people will know, so. Yeah. Well, that's really great. So, What's in store for you, Emily? Um, I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> I've spent the last few years painting like really small just because I had not a lot of time to paint. So now I'm, I'm started this winter kind of taping up big pieces of paper to the wall and trying to work bigger. And um, yeah, I don't know, just keep painting and working with local art, the local art community. And I'm on an advisory panel for some downtown like um, public art. So um, yeah, public art's awesome and really helps the community and it would help our community a lot. And yeah, I have a workshop hopefully in Ireland next year if everything's okay, but um, yeah, just. Well, that's really great. I know this, there's a printmaker here in Rochester, uh, Linda Condon, and she's been doing teaching in in Ireland for, for years. She goes okay. like in the spring and she teaches printmaking there. Oh, and uh, she just had a show this past year at the Letterer Gallery. Oh, wow. what's her name? Linda Condon, C-O-N-D-O-N. Oh, nice. Yeah, she has a studio at um, Anderson Alley. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, 
Is there something? <laughs> yeah. So you should like meet up with her. She's really nice and she'll be, uh, you can compare notes and maybe yeah. build out your uh, practice, you know? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm so appreciative of you all participating in this virtual exhibit. And I, what a, one of the things, of course, I hope is that one day they'll restart the art department at Geneseo. And this also, this show will tell the, you know, the powers that be that our students have gone on to be do great things, you know, and that it wasn't, you know, a situation where um, it was just for fun. I mean, it was start out, it starts out that way, but when you have really good experience with good teachers and good comrades, you know, it helps, you know, you begin to think about it differently. And, you know, it's more than just fun. It's a very, I think, kind of a cerebral kind of encounter with your environment, you know, with people and makes us, helps us all grow. So I want to thank you all so much for participating in this exhibition and especially for this, this interview panel that we've had and I look forward to your great works in the future. Please keep in touch, okay? Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you.